<laughs> okay, here we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my lecture on the Braceros, right? I'm just doing a little bit of background because us historians always have a long wind up to get to our point. That's why we are not liked on cable TV or CNN because we just can't do it in a 45 second soundbite. But one of the most indicative statistics, I think, that tells you about the toll of um, the Great Depression is that the only years in our country's history that more people left the US than came in and this is largely Mexican Americans, was between 1933 and 1935. Um, we were hit with such poverty and malnutrition. Americans were literally starving to death. Um, marital patterns changed. Those who were married remained married for the security. Those who were not married did not get married because they didn't want to right, invest in something that the insecurity of that. There were less children born at this time. I mean, Americans have historically been a population which reproduces itself naturally at pretty high rates. But during this time, less children were born um, and more folks left the US. So in, with an overwhelming popular vote and elector, electoral college victory, this guy from this very wealthy family in New York, the Roosevelt's, he was elected, he was the second Roosevelt to be elected in March, 1933, he was inaugurated. And he, he came upon the scene and said, the only thing to fear is fear itself. Wouldn't it be nice to have a message like that now? I think, I think we could need, we need a message like that now. <clears throat> and again, I'm doing the slow wind up to the Bracero part, but in 1936, in an effort to back up American workers effort to unionize in order to collective bargain and improve their situation as compared to the managerial class of the nation. Um, he enacted the National Labor Relations Act. <clears throat> and what this did was gave federal backing to private industry workers, the right to form a union, right? Private companies could not prevent American workers from doing it and to collectively bargain. So instead of just Lee asking his boss for more money, right, the whole people at Lee's work would collectively bargain, therefore they would have more, um, more power, more lobbying power. <clears throat> um, however, a very big factor, and I know I've probably pointed this out in another lecture, but it's very important and it's yet to be sort of um, fixed in our federal government's um, code of laws. The National Labor Relations Act of 1936 excluded domestic and farm workers from the right to form a union. And again, who made up most of domestics and farm workers? What kind of people were they if you looked at them through a sociological lens? Who were domestics and farm workers? Lee, Yadira, Emma, Ashley, and Monique? The minorities, people of color. Yeah, people of color and women. You're exactly right. In the Southeast, right, um, butlers were African-American men, maids were African-American women for the most part. Um, and in the Southeast, agricultural workers were African-Americans. In the Southwest, agricultural workers were largely, as you read in John Steinbeck's piece, right, Filipinos, Mexican-Americans, Japanese, and other folks of um, other ethnic minorities. <clears throat> Nevertheless, even though they weren't given the federal protections to form a union, many Mexican-American and Filipino-Americans in the West went on strike in order to try to force the, their um, employers to recognize their union. However, what do you do in the 1930s when so many of these migrants come in, right? There was a million refugees from Oklahoma and Arkansas came into the United States. And as we saw in one of the last lectures, um, 
what to do with the strikers? Well, they were deported, right? 1.0 new numbers. So 1.8 million quote unquote Mexicans were deported. All right, and that was a long windup. Now we're gonna get into new territory. So on <clears throat> December 7th, 1941, Japan act, attacked Pearl Harbor. US entered the war immediately after a long period of hesitancy to um, enter the war. Um, the Great Depression disappeared, right? Uh, through government programs and contracts, there was full employment almost overnight. 15 million Americans served in the war in one capacity or another. So all of a sudden the American economy needed more workers, right? Because all those Okies and Arkies who migrated over <clears throat> and were working the farmlands, where are they gonna go now? Who's gonna farm? And let me just pick on you all. Who are we gonna get to farm now that all these folks are going into the military and into factory work? Women. Yeah, gonna get women. Who said that, Ashley? Yep. Yeah. Right, and that's the unique position Mexicans have played in US migration. The reason why Mexicans have a unique place in US migration history is Mexico is right next to the United States, right? So it's an easy faucet to turn off and on when the American economy needs employer uh, um, workers since the 1880s, right? Mexicans are encouraged and even brought up by companies. And when the economy um, takes a pitfall, oftentimes Mexicans are seen as the scapegoat, literally, and then deported, right? You can't really do that with Irish or Greek or Chinese Americans, even though it's attempted, right? Because they're much, much geographically further. It's easier to deport Mexicans because Mexico's right there. <clears throat> so does anybody know anybody who's family members or friends came in with the Brasado program? Nobody? There's a couple of folks working at the college or at least one of them recently retired and I won't name names, but um, were, uh, did come up when their fathers and their uncles uh, came up and earned, came up with the Brasado program. So during the Brasero program, 1942 to 1964, 4 million uh, Mexicans total came up. Um, and this is the deal, right? This is probably some of the new information. And this is just an excuse for me to show you this wonderful photograph by Dorothea Lane. Isn't that a great photo? If I ever get a tattoo, it might be that guy, but it probably won't happen. Um, so the US government and the Mexican government got together and made a deal. And the United States government promised that employers here in the United States would guarantee their workers minimum housing. When I say minimum, I mean minimum, right? Um, laundry, bath, toilets, and waste disposal. Waste, basically um, clean sanitary conditions. The enforcement of that was always sketchy and many braceros actually sought out LULAC to argue for better improvements. Many civil rights workers argue that braceros were treated, you know, below the level of human dignity and that's, there's a lot of examples of that. So the original deal was um, they would have 30 days of work at uh, 30 cents an hour. They were, uh, they were guaranteed 30 days of work. They would be given free transportation to and from Mexico and within um, the Western United States farming places, right? And finally, when they return to Mexico, they would be paid 10% of their wage. So in other words, they were paid 90% of their wage when they were here, 10% was withheld. And when they returned to Mexico, they would be paid that. Why do you think they put this one last stipulation in it. Lee, Adira, Emma, Ashley, or Monique? So that Incentivize they sure. returning. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to incentivize their return. You know what, as early, as recent as four years ago, um, surviving Bracero workers are still trying to get the money from the Mexican government. They never paid them back. Typical, huh? Typico, as they would say in Mexico. Yep, never paid back. <clears throat> so the Bracero's were given nine month work visas for the harvest season. And many immigration reformers today not that I agree with this, but many immigration reformers today are arguing that we need now nine month work visas to bring in Mexicans because our fields are being drained of workers as we speak. Um, and these Mexicans replaced white workers and farms, railroad mines. So it wasn't just um, farm workers. It was um, all kinds of laborers, especially throughout the, the Southwest. This this isn't actually an official Bracero like paperwork, the papeles you have to get. And a couple of years ago, one of my students in this History 35 class um, showed me her, I think her uncle's paperwork from a, his time as a Bracero. Oh, by the way, when they came in, they were given DDT pesticide blasts. Oh man. Anybody know what DDT is? An orange. Agent Orange. It's a horrifically poisonous, toxic um, solution. And the argument was that, man, these Mexicans, they have lice, they have fleas, who knows what they have, right? They're dirty Mexicans. And I, I mean Hi, that baby. in a very tongue in cheek way. It's, um, it's a pretty horrific thing to do to anybody. Right? Horrible. Um, let's pivot over and look at the Mexican government's role in this. During the Mexican Revolution, it politicized many Mexicans to fight for better rights. As we saw in the lecture I did on uh, Reyes Lopez Tijerina, many Mexicans were fighting for right, land and liberty and a political place on the table in Mexico. So come the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, the Mexican government shifted to more conservative policies and they wanted to get rid of a lot of these rabble rousers, right? A lot of these folks fighting for social justice. So what did the Mexican government do? They cherry picked many folks who were politically radical and gave them but a set of paperwork to get rid of them, literally to get them out of town. Isn't that interesting? Oh, by the way, this is a photo of Mexicans uh, lining up to try to sign up for the Bedecero program, right? Seeking the opportunity in something in California. And the result of which um, during the Bracero period, and Bracero just means like manual labor, Bracero really literally means arm, right? So it, in our version would be manual labor, like using your man, your hands. Or like my uncle likes to joke, Manuel labor. Oh man, I need a laugh track. You all don't provide me my laugh track. Next time I record this, I'm gonna to have to download an app with a laugh track so I can hopefully think my jokes are funny. <clears throat> and this is the context by which um, Braceros on one hand are, right, the backbone to the US agricultural economy, Southwestern economy throughout the war years. Yet on the other hand, they are dehumanized and not named in, for example, the New York Times newspaper right here. They're just called deportees people that were just gonna be deported after they worked. <clears throat> and that is the context in which Woody Guthrie wrote this song, uh, Plane Wreck at Los Gatos. You all, I don't think any of you are in my US history class, but you know that song, this land is your land, this land is my land? From California to the New York Island. Come on, Emma and Monique, and you, you all know this song, right? In kindergarten, you had to do it, right? And everybody's feeling good, and then you get a treat and a nap, right? Um, do you know where Woody Guthrie wrote that song, This Land is Your Land? Don't think too hard. Random guesses are fine. 
thought it was about natives, but I wasn't sure. I'm sorry, say it again, Ashley. I said I thought it was about na natives or something. I remember it being like a controversial song for some reason. Oh yeah, Woody Guthrie was very controversial for all reasons. Basically, this land is your land, this land is my land, has one stanza, for example, that says, I see a no trespassing sign and my land's on the back of it. In other words, he's not respecting signs that protect private property, right? He was very much a political radical on the left and that was very controversial. This is just an aside to, um, yeah, because I like him. Um, he wrote it in Shasta Lake, California in 1940 when Shasta Dam was being built. He came to visit all the workers at Shasta Dam and wrote, hey guys, this land is your land, this land is my land, right? We can do this. So um, yay, some local history, Woody. So go and listen to a modern version of it. Yadira will not probably like the original, so Emma will have to maybe give her some pointers on how to... Um, Read good Woody Guthrie between the lines. <clears throat> oh, okay, here's a little more. I have a quick question. Yes, ma'am, before I drop a jokey meme. Um, can we backtrack when you said that the Mexican government was giving Mexicans the Bracero papers? Why, why was the reason for that? And how did they choose who they were giving these papers to? Great question. Um, a lot of, I don't know the exact numbers, but most of the Mexican men who were given um, Bracero paperwork like this were chosen from deep Mexico. When I say deep Mexico, I mean, you know, south of Guadalajara, like way down in Southern Mexico. Oh, are you looking at me or my screen right now? You. Okay, you don't want to do that. Okay. So the Mexican government, their political logic was we're having political tension in central Mexico. It was in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, just like in the United States, there were people fighting for civil rights. Mexicans were fighting for their own civil, economic, and political rights. And of course, the Mexican government wanted to keep power and wanted these rabble rousers out. So many of the folks who were given these um, Bracero permits were these rabble rousers from southern Mexico. And another reason why they were from, when I say deep Mexico, I mean way in the south, is because to incentivize them to follow the law, like come up here to all the way to the United States, work, and then go all the way back to Mexico, right? Don't settle on the border. Does that answer your question a bit, Yadira, or further confused? Yes, thank you, it does. All right. Okay, here's a little, okay, a little more humor. I can't help it. Have y'all seen this one? An American family holding hands, praying, thanking Jesus for food. <clears throat> and what's the punchline? What is de nada? Somebody explain the punchline. You're welcome for picking it. Yeah, so thank you. Jesus, Jesus. is his name. <laughs> Yeah, so there's Jesus. Yeah. Like, wow. Nada, no problem. Isn't it interesting that in many um, Latin cultures, uh, families name their young boys Jesus, but we don't. Do you know anybody called Jesus? Right? Is there like a Jesus Smith living down over in, right? Red Bluff? I haven't met him. So there you all, if you all are gonna ever have families, name, name your kid uh, Jesus Howard. See how it works out. Okay, all right, enough of the jokes. Okay, you go get it. So <clears throat> one of the questions I asked you about the Bracero program is who do you think supported it in the United States? Who would have been one of the pillars of support for this program, given the fact that in the 1930s, 1 1.8 million Mexicans were deported. Who would have supported it? Monique, Ashley, Emma, Yadira, or Lee? 
Mexican government. Yep. Yep. Mexican government. Who else might have supported it? You know what us professors are told to do when we ask a question? Not answer it right away, but just like take a slow, slow sip of your tea. There's my slow slip, a slow sip. So Emma, Ashley, uh, Monique, or Yadira, who else might have supported it? Probably uh, rich farm owners in California because uh, they would the people brought over for the Bracero program would probably have been entitled to less rights than uh, the people who are already uh, farming. Exactly. <clears throat> Because the people who are already farming, like Juanita Garcia, you're going to read a little snippet from Juanita Garcia's um, testimony to Congress in the 1950s. She totally opposed the program because her and her allies were fighting for farmers' rights, right? Farm workers' rights and the right to form a union. So Juanita Garcia and other Mexican Americans and other farm laborers didn't like the competition of the Braceros because of course the Braceros were paid a lot less, right? So they were undermining the efforts of the United Farm Workers Union to be legitimate. So one of the main forces fighting against the Bracero program were people like um, Dolores Huerta and her type, right? She sympathized them, sympathized with them, but saw how they were being used to undermine the farm labor movement. By the way, this film, Dolores, I've tried every which way. Um, I've tried many workarounds to try to upload this and offer it to you. I can't figure it out. So I can't, I'm not gonna force you to pay and play, but if you can watch this documentaries, I know I've plugged it like 15 times in the last three weeks, but please watch it. It is so inspirational and well done and entertaining. And it's gonna really change the way we look at the farm labor movement and the person of Dolores Huerta in American history. So please check this out. You can see it on Google Play and there's a couple other platforms, I forget now. And if y'all can figure it out how to, how I can upload it to class, let me know. Okay. Um, who do you think was against the pro, I just told you. Okay. Well, let me do my job. Who supported the program? Uh, just as Lee said, U.S. businesses using braceros, right? They were inexpensive, right? They're not gonna unionize, right? They're not gonna organize. They're gonna work hard for very, very little. Who else supported the braceros? The braceros themselves. Many Mexicans did see the opportunity to come up. And even though they weren't getting paid as well as American workers, it was sure a lot better than what was going on in Mexico, right? Period, end of story. Who was critical of the program? Well, Mexican-American farm workers fighting for better conditions. US laborers who felt that they were being undercut by cheaper Mexican labor. Another force critical of the program were civil rights advocates um, like Lula and others because they said, wait a minute, you're bringing up this very low paid laborers and they have really poor conditions. This is not right. So this is a civil rights issue as well. <clears throat> and lastly, many braceros were critical of the program because they said, man, we have horrible conditions. We aren't getting paid what we should, right? So of course I put braceros in both these categories. <clears throat> in fact, um, the US Border Patrol, and remember one of their early mandates was to control the border like a faucet right? So to invite migrants in when we needed them and kick them out when they didn't. So against the Bracero program's policies, um, the Border Patrol opened up the Mexican border to illegal Mexican migrants to come up. And this was in violation of the Bracero program because we needed more laborers in October 1948. So even the federal government Border Patrol didn't abide by the Bracero program uh, themselves in this one famous incident in El Paso in October 1948. <clears throat> and this just goes to show whoo, a lot of words. So this is why, oh yeah, I'm going to post this on um, 
How do you explain the waves of 20th century Mexican migration? Well, in the 1910s, in the era of like, remember Tomochic that we talked about way back, um, the US economy was good and the Mexican revolution was bad for Mexico. So a lot of Mexican migrants came in in the, 1930, in the 1910s, right? All the way 1880s to 1910s. <clears throat> in the 1930s, when the economy went south and many Mexican Americans were scapegoated for being the cause of the economic woes, um, Mexican Americans were forced out, right? The US economy was bad. And plus on the Mexican side, after the Mexican Revolution, as you might have seen in the Frida Kahlo film, there was a lot of programs in Mexico to, you know, restructure land ownership laws in Mexico. So there was a lot of positive programs happening for Mexicans that drove a lot south in the 1930s. <clears throat> the 1940s, U.S. economy good, Mexicans come up. You get what I mean, right? You're understanding. And what was going on in Mexico? Well, there was a lot of investment in Mexico's urban infrastructure. This is when like Acapulco was built. This is when a lot of investment in Mexico, like in Mexico City, there was a lot of urban investment kind of um, ignoring the rural economy. So many farmers uh, left. In the 1950s, I kid you not. What does that say right there? Can you all read it? Operation what? What does it say? I just want to hear one of your wonderful voices. Here, you can see it bigger. What's the operation called? Come on. Who's going to be brave enough to say it? Have you all heard this term before, wetback? Yeah? What does it mean in general? Growing up in Southern California, I like heard it all the time. In Spanish, it's called mojado, but why is it called wetback? I mean, what's the deal with that? Because it's implying that uh, you cross the border illegally and you cross it through the Rio Grande, pretty much, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And this That's was the actual right. name of the federal program. This isn't some name some historian brought up. Isn't that crazy? Operation wetback? Holy mackerel. So 1 million Mexicans were deported in 1954 because the economy was doing well, right? And um, the United States economy didn't need Mexican laborers and they wanted to scapegoat them once again. So send them back across the border. And then from the 1980s to 2007, let me put eight, <clears throat> a lot of Mexicans came in because in the 1980s to 2008, the US economy was strong, right? The Mexican economy was bad for reasons why we're gonna get into in assignment four. We'll talk a lot about neoliberalism and NAFTA and how Mex many Mexicans couldn't compete with the super subsidized um, American farming system, right? So many Mexicans came from 1980s to 2008, however, since 2008, wait, let me put 2008 to, what's a recent year? Give me a recent year, there we go. From 2008 to 2018, um, many Mexicans actually left the United States because the US economy was bad, All right? Now let's change this to 60. And the Mexican economy was relatively good and plus just the um, explicit racism against Mexicans during these years led many to leave, right? And there was like a net, net outflow of Mexicans coming. And as we'll, we talk about in assignment four, and Emma and I, we talked about this on Friday, um, I'll be explaining why there's a net influx of refugees in the last couple of years with the caravans. And if I could, why, um, excuse, why has there been folks coming up the southern border, not just Mexicans, but Guatemalans, I mean, people from Africa. What's fueling this caravan of folks who are coming to the border today trying to seek refuge, uh, asylum? A huge part of it is uh, <clears throat> because of the uh, gang wars in El Salvador. Yeah, and I'm going to talk about that 
Do y'all want to hear about the U.S. role in Central America and how that led to the exodus? Okay, I got a whole thing on that. Oh, good. Yeah, um, in the 1980s, there was a lot of, there was a big effort by Guatemalans, Nicaraguans, and Salvadorans to like have local sovereignty, right? To govern the way they want to without a heavy handed US influence. And the US responded with that in the 1970s and 80s with nasty, uh, supporting nasty, nasty wars. And what's more in the 1980s, a lot of um, Salvadoran and Mexican American gangbangers from LA and others were, um, were relocated and deported down to El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, not Nicaragua, Honduras. And um, they started gangs down there, right? And that's the, that's the um, origin, right? The germination of, Mexico, of Central American gangs and along with the corrupt kleptocracy that's in Central America, many folks are leaving and dying to leave, literally dying to leave and they're stuck on the border, yeah. All right, I'm gonna end the recorded part of this right now, but I will stay on. Um, yes, okay, everybody, so zoomy, zoomy, if you're listening to the recorded version, if you have any questions or comments, take care, how do I end recording, stop recording.